Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Pacific Beach. Uh, my name is Joel. Thanks for worshiping with us. Let's stand and sing together. Joy in my heart 
break every chain. You break every chain. You break every chain. You break every chain. Break every chain. Let's pray. Dear God, you break every chain. Thank you so much for the sacrifice. Jesus, your son, that you sent down, gave to us as a free gift, despite what we deserve, God. Be there with us through this week, through our lives. Watch over us. Watch our families. And let us honor you in all we do. In your name I pray. Amen. Listen, as you're finding your seat, I'm going to turn uh, to the Gospel of John. We are in John chapter 3. So listen, if it's your first time here to 1st PB, uh, here's what we are about. We are about Jesus, because we believe that Jesus is bigger, Jesus is better. And that's why we open the Bible and preach the Bible, because the Bible lets us know these things. So if you're new, welcome. We're glad you're here. We are walking through the Gospel of John, and uh, we do what we do, and that is we open the Bible, we walk through verse after verse, because as we do so, our hearts are ministered to as God reveals Himself to be who He is. So we're in John chapter 3. We come to an all-important, very famous passage this morning. The title of the message is The Greatest Expression of Love. Now, last week, my mom, who in our house we commonly refer to as Mimi, uh, sent a package to my kids. This package is stocked with well-thought-out, strategically purchased material blessings for my kids. These, pa- these packages are asked about incessantly. Where's the package? Has Mimi sent it? Then we track it frequently, all the way until it finally arrives on our doorstep. And why? Because there is something that is beautiful and true in giving. A genuine desire for Mimi to bring my kids joy and comfort, though she's miles away. She does everything she can to express such love and joy and comfort in the form of of a gift. Gifts are an expression. They're an expression of giving, an expression of love in a very concrete way. And here's the reality. That essential aspect is a remarkable reflection in the way that God relates to all of His creation. And so this morning we will see as we walk through this familiar, even famous passage of Scripture, the greatest expression of love in the form of God's gift to us. Would you stand as we read God's Word together? John chapter 3, beginning in verse 16 to verse 21. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, as we open up your word, we believe that it is true and we believe that it is powerful. Powerful enough to change us. And so, Lord, my prayer is that you would bind me to the text and at the same time that your Holy Spirit would do a work. A work that is unseen, but a work that is supernaturally good and glorious. In other words, Lord, change our lives because of the word preached. We don't want to be the same. We want to be changed. So illumine to us 
things that are dark in our lives, that the, the light of the gospel might do a work. Sanctify us, Lord. Conform us into the image of your Son. Be honored and glorified through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Every good thing that we receive in this life is a personal expression of God's love and care towards us. Psalm chapter 145, verses 14 through 17. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His works. In the New Testament, James would write it like this. Chapter 1, verse 17. You know this passage. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I hope that this morning you come to an increased appreciation of the magnificence of our giving God, especially the gift of His own Son, Jesus Christ. Our God is a generous God who loves to give gifts they overflow from Him. He is a gift-giving God. So likewise, I pray that you will fully appreciate the preciousness of the greatest gift God has ever given. And though this is a familiar and famous passage, do not let it become irrelevant in your life. This is one of the clearest expressions of God's saving, gift-giving love to all the world. There is an emphasis here there is a priority of the gracious intention of God in giving Jesus for the salvation of the world. Just a few things I want you to see from this passage. Ready? The first thing is this. God's love for the world. God's love for the world. Now you have your Bibles open. When I say a verse, read the verse. Look at the words. They're meaningful. You know this verse. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. I'm going to say it time and time again. The gift of Jesus is an expression of the Father's immense love for the world. Jesus came and died for sinners because the Father loved the world. Guys, the gift of Jesus wasn't earned. It wasn't a gift earned by the world. To be very clear, God's love initiated the sending of Jesus to the world. All Him. This gift-giving, the thing that we feel, gratitude and giving, the joy we receive, all of it is rooted in a gift-giving God who has fully expressed this in His initiation of giving the Son. God loved the world so much with the result that He gave His only Son. You ask the question, who is the world? Who is it that John is talking about? Is it all people? Or those throughout the world who God will save? It's a question that many people ask, but I think it is important to understand the context of what is happening here in this passage. I think when you read this passage of Scripture in light of the context, last week we went in depth on Jesus and the conversation He has with Nicodemus. When you take into the context, I think this passage makes it very clear that the world in this passage is referring to all people in the world. God loved the world. All people. Now as I say that, the next verse, verse 17, also makes it clear that in the world, there will be some who believe in Christ and some who tragically don't. Which means 
The love that moved God to send His Son was a universal, indiscriminate love for the world and it includes a sincere desire for all people to come to repentance and believe in Jesus Christ that they might receive salvation. We talk about this love. You do know that the love of God is incomprehensible. It's immeasurable. Like we, we truly cannot understand the depths of God's love. But you look to the Old Testament and you hear from the prophets. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Ezekiel wrote, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back! Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? In the New Testament, Peter said it like this, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is the desire of a gift-giving love, the gift-giving love of God. This is the desire. But not everyone does repent and receive salvation. Yet still, God loves everyone. God is a God of love. And the Word doesn't say less than that. That's what the Word says here. The love that is spoken of here is not a love that is elicited because the world is so lovely. John is speaking of humanity from a perspective of sin. That's an important thing to to know here. John is inspired to write the Word, and as he's writing the Word and he's doing this, understand that he is speaking from a perspective of humanity. It's, it's a state of being under, under God's wrath. Now, we, we get to God's wrath and we're like, oh gosh, is that really something we want to talk about? But understand, you can't read John 3.16 and throw it as the banner without also reading John 17. Understand that when you have John 16 and 17, there is a complexity here. By nature, the whole world stands under the condemnation of God. It's just the reality. Because it wasn't a sinful God that created this. It was a holy, loving God that created this. And I would say it like this. God's personal stance towards sin is wrath. It's got to be. And yet, this is the amazing truth that we see in this passage. Watch this now. Watch this. That same holy and righteous God out of His mercy and love provides the way out. We don't deserve this love. It's offered freely to sinners. This morning, I know life is hard. You've had a long week. Let me ask you, are you doubting God's love for you? Let it be known that it is His desire and His willingness to save you if you would turn to His Son and be saved. The Scripture declares that to everyone on the planet, God loves you. He created you and you are the work of His hands. And though we have failed in loving Him, He he doesn't desire for us to perish. He desires to save us and provide for us. So I want you to look at your life for a moment in light of all of its difficulties in light of all that you're facing, the grief, the sorrow, the doubts, the anxiety, the pressures, the stress, and all of these things, look at your life and see the immeasurable evidences of this love. The giving of His Son is the greatest piece of evidence. That has to go to the forefront of your mind. The second thing I want you to see is the gift of God's only Son. What does it mean that God gave His Son? Now, if you look at verses 14 and 15, Jesus has been speaking to Nicodemus about being born again. So you read verses 14 and 15, and they're very pivotal because they lead up to actually the verse that we're familiar with, the famous verse, John 3, 16. You have to know verses 14 and 15 lead up to verse 16. So look with me, verse 14 through 15. Watch this now. Jesus, and as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. 
Moses and the serpent in the wilderness. That is what, that is what leads up to verse 16. Why does Jesus compare Himself to a snake? That's what He's doing with Nicodemus. He's talking about being born again, all of these things. And then He takes Nicodemus and takes him all the way back to a particular story. It seems actually strange. Jesus refers to Himself as a serpent in a story, a strange story, in which Israel had been wandering in the wilderness after being freed from bondage. It's, it's, a little, it's a little strange story. I want you to read all of it. Numbers chapter 21, verses 4-9. through 9. You don't have to turn there. Read with me on the screen. For Mount Or they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that He may take away the serpents from us. So, Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, watch this now, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone... He would look at the bronze serpent and live. We have the people coming under the wrath of God. Isn't that pretty apparent? Now the question is, why would they come and experience the wrath of God? It's simple. Here it is. Their ingratitude and their grumbling. We loathe this food. Why has God brought us out? It doesn't satisfy us. It's as simple as that comes down to ingratitude and a little bit of grumbling. Poisonous snakes, how's that for punishment? Poisonous snakes are sent to bite them and kill them. You know, I can't read this passage without thinking of Coyote Peterson. You know the YouTube personality? This guy, this guy voluntarily allows animals and bugs to sting and bite him. And after he is bitten, he always says, Searing pain. That's literally, he holds his arm and he says, searing pain. It's a joke in our house. Like when we get hurt, we're like, searing pain. Coyote Peters, that's what he does. I mean, he's, he's done like, I think even the murder home. Am I right, Will? Like, yeah, yeah, thumbs up. I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? The searing pain and even death from the striking fangs of these servants is just a Temporal, small expression of the final judgment of God. Small in comparison to the eternal judgment. So we hold our forearms and we think just searing pain. Our ingratitude, our grumbling, poisonous snakes biting us. That's just a small little consequence. Just temporal. That's what the people of God are experiencing. Jesus draws them back to Numbers. But notice in this story from Numbers, watch this now. God makes a provision for those who are bitten. They're crying out, searing pain. And in comes God. Put a bronze serpent on a pole. If someone who is bitten looks at the serpent, they will be healed and not die. You know what that means? That means that God chose to deliver His people through the very curse they are suffering under. That is what they are to look to and be saved. Jesus says these things to Nicodemus in verses 14 through 16. So, when you read verses 14 through 16 and you follow the natural thought, it means the Father's giving of the Son... Jesus was the giving Him up to the embodiment of our curse. 
Then it was biting snakes. Lift up the servant, serpent. Now it is the sun on the cross. That's why you get to verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Here it is now. Here it is now. This is where we relate in our ingratitude and maybe our grumbling. This is where we see that God sent Jesus in order that He might be lifted on a cross. And for anyone who is experiencing searing pain of sin and death, all you have to do is look up and see Him. That's it. That's all you have to do. God sends His Son. He takes on the embodiment of the curse so that all who are cursed and condemned, guys, you just take all of who you are and you look to the one hanging on the tree, crucified and taking on the punishment, and you will be saved. All your ingratitude, all your grumbling, all your sin, all your condemnation. It's gone. When you look to the one lifted on that tree, blood-soaked wood, Paul says it like this in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone who is hanged on a tree. Paul would say it like this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, <laughs> He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Mind-blowing. Jesus, the embodiment of our curse. Just look to Him. That we might become the righteousness of God. What does this mean? It means there's no greater gift. This gift is a gift of infinite cost and infinite blessing. Verse 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not come for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Watch this now. It is because God has satisfied His own wrath in the sending of His own Son as a sacrifice that those who believe in Christ will receive the gift of salvation. What does this mean? It means you will not perish. You won't perish. For billions upon billions of people in the world, they should fear death because death is a massive, massive, eternal impediment between a holy God and sinful people. But Jesus Christ comes and takes the embodiment of the curse. We look to Him for belief and then death becomes but a little smokescreen, a thin veil. We don't fear it. There's now barely any divider between a sinner and Jesus because when we look to Jesus, He's taken on our curse. We become as the righteousness of God. Therefore, sinners now smash through death on that final breath. And we experience eternal life with God. This is the greatest expression of love. And all of it is possible because of this gift. I want you to see I want you to see the tragic reality that as good as this gift is, this gift can be received and it can be rejected. It can be received, it can be rejected. It is universally given. Universally given. It's God's expression of love to all the world. Anyone can receive it. But all don't. 
So it leads to the third thing, the third point, the gift rejected. The gift rejected. Now I want you to see, God didn't send Jesus in the world to condemn the world. He did not do that. It's very, very clear. God did not do that. Why? Because the world was already under condemnation. That's what verse 17 lets us know. God didn't, come to, God, God didn't send Jesus to condemn. The world was already condemned. That's what you see. Jesus didn't have to come from heaven to earth to do that. If Jesus hadn't come, every man and woman would have rightly suffered under the just wrath of God for our, all of our sins. If Jesus hadn't come, it would have been snake biting at its finest. No antidote, no antivenom. Everyone's dying. Why? Ingratitude and grumbling. That's it. That's it. Food's terrible. Why? God, this life is miserable. And in all those questions, all they receive is snake biting. That's it. Jesus didn't have to come into the world to do that. Man already does that. God sent Jesus in order that the world might be saved from sin. However, those who reject the gift, rather than inheriting re eternal life, remain under the condemnation. I want you to see something here. If you're marking in your Bible, I want you to look to the words, whoever. There are a couple whoever's. The whoever's of these verses is wonderfully expansive and fearfully limiting. Whoever receives, whoever rejects. Wonderfully expansive, fearfully limiting. Anyone believes in the Son will not perish. Anyone who does not believe in the Son, in the Son already stands condemned. Jump with me to John chapter 3, verse 36. There's a connection point here. You find more whoever's. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God does what? Does it come to him? Start then? No. It remains on him. Now, when it says whoever does not believe is condemned already, it is not to call someone to think that if they have not trusted in Christ, that there is no chance of doing so. Every one of us, at some point or another, we were living in a state of unbelief. And so all of life, life boils down to this. We had to move from unbelief to belief. That's life. We can spend campaign after campaign. We can protest. We can do all of, the mo all of the movements we want to. But if someone doesn't transfer from unbelief to belief, all of it is worthless. This is all that matters. Unbelief to belief. That's it. That's what this verse lets us know. This is the point. It is to emphasize the importance of right now. Why should the church be doing what the church should be doing right now? Is because in light of all the cultural turmoil, in light of all of the societal uncertainty, the church knows what is urgent now and forever. Nothing changes in this. We know what is urgent. And here's why. Here's why. The verdict of final judgment that all of us will face before a holy God is determined by right now. Right now. If you have not trusted in Jesus, then you need to realize you are currently living under that verdict. And that verdict carries over to eternity. So the natural question to ask at this point is, why, 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 why would anyone refuse such a great salvation that has come through Christ? Why? Why can't they be convinced? Look to verses 19 through 20. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. 
And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Brothers and sisters, according to these verses, the problem, gosh, it's a terrible problem. The problem is not a lack of information. It's not a lack of historical proof. Not a lack of intellectual reason. The problem is a moral problem. The reason why people do not receive this gift is because they love sin more than salvation. That's it. That's what 19 through 20 tells us. What a tragedy. We fear having our sin exposed for what it really is. We want, to, we want to keep it in the darkness. No! No! It's mine. I don't care what you have to offer. I love me some me. I don't care if it's free. I don't care if it comes with eternal life. Right here, right now, I choose unbelief because I love my sin. Now, remember the context. I'm almost, almost done here. Remember the context. Jesus has been talking to a Pharisee, Nicodemus. This is not an adulterer. This is not a mass murderer. This is not a money launderer. This is a religious leader. The most famous passage of the Bible happens to be said during a conversation with a man who is doing really good things. The darkness and evil in verses 19, 19 through 20 point us to something now. They point us to pride. They point us to self-righteousness. It points us to ingratitude. It, 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 it points us to approval of others. Legalism. Refusing to submit to God. But here, here's what it really points to. Nicodemus was really just about suppressing the truth. That's really what it points us to. That's what it is. That's what Nicodemus has been doing, suppressing the truth. Jesus is saying all of these things. Listen to me. I'm this guy. I am the light. I am the sun. I am the eternal word. I am all of these things. I am the Messiah. I'm it. And Nicodemus, it all boils down to, I don't want to choose you because I like what I like. And right now, I just don't like what you're saying. And I don't accept you. That's what's happening. Think about the Jews of Jesus' day. They had evidence of the Messiah, but they rejected Him because of the hardness of their hearts. And that, my friends, has been the story for generation after generation. Perpetual rejection despite the utter truth. This is clear in its warning. No one will stand before God. Watch this now. No one will stand before God and say, you didn't do enough. John 3, 16 lets us know, God did plenty. There's no other way to express such love than the gift of Jesus. No one at the end of time will say, you didn't do enough. I was inadequately provided for. I didn't know. No, 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 no. You did know. You just loved you more than you loved Jesus. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? But watch this. Verse 21 lets us know that that doesn't have to be the story. Verse 21 shows us the gift received. Verse 21 shows us that some do receive, some come to the light. Look with me. Verse 21, we'll wrap up. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now, when you read verse 21, the question is, what does this look like? I don't think verse 21 is describing the moment when someone comes to faith in Christ. I don't think verse 21 is that specific moment when someone goes from unbelief to belief. What I think is being described is the ongoing nature of the life who 
the, the ongoing nature of the life of someone who believes in Christ Jesus. I think that's what's going on here. Why? Because I want you to notice the contrast between verses 19 and 20 to verse 21. Verse 19 through 20 reads like this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. What does this mean? It means that some reject the light. They don't want the exposure. That is in contrast to verse 21. Verse 21 is a verse of contrast because you see, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Some do good things in order for good deeds to be shown. He basically says, the one who believes in Jesus understands that God is always the giver. That's what it comes down to. The one who understands all of this and believes in Jesus understands that God is always a good giver. In fact, He's not only the giver of Jesus, He's the giver of all good deeds. They they carry out through the goodness of God. And so what, why, do, why do we make this point? It means that if you come, you transfer from unbelief to belief. If you look to the one who's hanging on the tree and you believe in this gift of love, it means that your life, your testimony, will be the overflowing, giving grace of God through Christ in everything you do. It's a life of worship. Why? Because Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. My question to you, and I'll be pointed with the questions and end my time. Very simple questions. These questions are questions that hang in the balance. They're asked by a very temporal preacher who will preach the best he can, one day die and be forgotten. But these questions are questions that you will have to address throughout your life, and before God. The question this morning is, have you come to the light? Have you believed in Christ Jesus? Have you trusted in Him for salvation? And prayerfully during this sermon, one thing that has become very apparent is God is willing to save whoever will come. That is why He gave His Son. To receive you, to save you. This is the greatest gift that has ever been given. May we as a church rejoice in the abundant generosity and the giving of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, it scares me. It scares me to think what might be exposed of the souls in this room if we saw things the way Jesus sees them. But Lord God, my prayer is that the true picture of what is in this room would actually be one of hope, showing the evidence of many people in this room who have come to the reality that life comes down to this. Believe or don't believe. Trust in Jesus or trust in sin. Lord, I have done what I can do. And Lord, right now, I fully believe in what the Spirit is capable of doing. So Lord, I pray that in a a very unique and real act of mercy and grace, your Spirit would right now change those who do not believe in Jesus to become believers. And Lord, I also pray that your spirit would prove to your church that Jesus is the gift that keeps 
on giving. It's a gift that we will behold for all of eternity. Help us not to hoard this gift. Help us not to suppress this gift. Help us to do as you have done for us. To express the free nature of it. Lead us to be a church who receives it and gives it. We believe in your word preached and now we trust in the spirit moving. Do a work, Lord. That's our prayer. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Just a moment, we're going to stand. Even Jesus. And I pray that what Jesus is doing right now through His Spirit, He will do throughout today, through this next week, until we see Him face to face. May that be the testimony of your life and the testimony of our church. Would you stand? And as we sing, here's, here's what I invite you to do. If this morning you need to talk about where you are in your faith with Jesus, talk to me. Some of you have walked in this room. You've been in San Diego for days, months, and years. You've been trying to follow Jesus alone. Don't do that. Here's a church that is willing to walk with you. We will do what we can to point you to Jesus. That's our commitment. Let's sing. Joel, you lead us. Praise me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I see thy fight fade? Heal my wounded, broken spirit. Save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than light to me. Whom have I on earth beside Thee? Whom in heaven but Thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Calling 
do not pass me by. I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a moment, just a moment. Uh, so for the past couple of weeks, uh, I've uh, mentioned, uh, well, really, I've talked about tonight. Tonight is important, and you should be here. So what's going to happen is you're going to go home, you're going to eat lunch, and you're going to think to yourself, I haven't got the energy to come back. And what I need you to do is find the energy to come back. What tonight begins for us is a three-Sunday sequence of articulating where we are going as a church, being affirmed in our calling, and then October 11th, taking specific action. Action that we will take that will require you being a part of bold steps of faith, moving first P, B, forward. When you think about whether we're going to stay here or we're going to go there, what I need you to begin to see is that God is calling you to be a part of this. This is the Lord's church, but He's called you to be a part of it. This is what we give our life to. So we want you to hear who we are, how we're going to do it, and when we know we're actually doing it. Tonight's the beginning of that. You're going to hear from me, you're going to hear from others articulating our mission of a church. What First PB is to do in order to honor the Lord. It's going to be at 5 o'clock. Good news, parents, especially as you're thinking, man, my kids are restless right now. Child care will be provided. All right? Yes. Woohoo. Um, a girl named Courtney Van Wilp is watching the kids. Uh, when, I, when I served in children's ministry at a church in Arkansas, I think Courtney was like in TK. So now she's graduated from college. She's in San Diego, and she's watching our kids tonight. So come as a family, bring your kids, and be ready. It's going to be a really, really good night. This is week one. Next week, you'll hear from Jeremy Ayett, our city missionary of the North American Mission Board. Then on week three, we'll spend the morning articulating exactly what we're seeking to do. It'll be a process, but guys, we have so much to look forward to. And I'm overwhelmed with gratitude that the Lord has called you to be a part of. I really, really am. So whether or not you are sort of just kind of on the fringe at first PB, in fact, today you might just be on the very fringe, like you just barely walked in. Come tonight. Come tonight. Maybe the Lord will use it to figure out if you're going to move from the fringe to the core. We pray that that would be the, we pray that that'd be the case. We invite you to be a part of it. Now, five o'clock. Everybody got it? We good? Moving back. And we're saddened. But we are so grateful. David has done just like so much just to prove what the Lord is doing and calling people here. Uh, and, and, and David, in short order, you have come in here with an attitude that we have certainly appreciated. We need it. And more than missing your rhythmic ability, and we will miss it. Uh, man, we'll miss your go get them spirit and your willingness to do whatever it is to, to serve Jesus and to serve this church. And in short time, this church has fallen in love with you as you've fallen in love with it. Thanks. And I'll miss you. Normally, I'd have y'all come and surround him and lay hands on him and we pray him out. This dumb pandemic. And so, stay seated and, and just pray in agreement uh, as we pray for David and as we trust him to the Lord, believing that... Uh, Though this season and this chapter is coming to an end, that the Lord's got greater things for David to do. So David, that's our prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, when I thank you for the gift of brotherhood, it, there's nothing like it, Lord. Brotherhood that is built on the blood of Jesus Christ is life-giving to the soul. There's something unique and special to it. And Lord, I thank you for what you did in laying 1 PB on David's heart for sending him up to the front doors and for using him like you've used him in some short time. Lord, we pray, we pray that as we send David out, that you would use him, continue to use him. Lord, I pray that you would use him in an even greater way. 
Lord, grow his love for you. Grow his love for your church and for the things that you're about. Lord, help him to get back on his feet financially with a business. Give him clients. Um, Lord, thank you for sustaining him during this time. And Lord, we pray also that you would send us more Davids. More people that would walk through the front door and say, I want to be about Jesus. Can this church help me? Lord, we do thank you that uh, as we pray people away, that it is very temporary and that one day we will forever and always be secured in our salvation as we are in heaven praising Jesus. Until then, find us faithful. Find us living for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you, David. Love you, man. Um, you guys be here and find David and uh, wish him all the best. Uh, love you, people. And I, I encourage you go home, eat, get some rest. Be back at five. If you miss it, I'm going to be so.